It's good to see you all. God bless you tonight. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1, uh, the middle of the verse, because that's how far we got two weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, hey, I think we're going to be ambitious to take on two and a half verses. So let's, no promises though. You know, we're kind of stalling for the return of Jesus Christ. So he could finish this and we'll get it right. <laughs> Father, as we go into the book of Revelation right now, we pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, and that, Lord, we would just be, Lord, sobered, sobered by what's ahead, but at the same time excited about you and you accomplishing what you've promised to do. And, Lord, to see Jesus, oh, that's what this book is about. It's about Jesus. And I pray, Father, that we would see you and we would know you and we would love you and we would be ready for you and we would keep this book as we look at this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The revelation of Jesus Christ, we're looking at the first three verses. We um, jumped in uh, you know, at verse one and we got through the first two lines, I think in our introduction, and there's still more uh, introduction to do, so we'll see how it goes. But um, let's go ahead and re read the first three verses, get them fresh in our minds. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The time is near. And boy, I'll tell you, if they could say that then, yeah. oh, we can say that now. <laughs> My goodness, we can say that now. All right, so the book of Revelation is not a hard book to understand. It has its own divine outline. And that's given to us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, chapter 1. We're going to see all that uh, as we get uh, past the introduction and into the resurrected Christ and his glory. And then it says, and the things which are the church age, which we're a part of. That excites me. Like, oh yeah, we're not so far into this book yet. We get to uh, be a part of the church age, and we're going to see that, that uh, the seven churches uh, are specifically seven historic churches that God was speaking to, but in his prophetic word, it applied to all the church age. And you'll see the hints they're, they're, that are, actually, they're not hints, they're clear. They're clearly stated in chapters two and three. So chapters two and three in John's world and in his writing are present, the church age, as Christ has ascended into heaven given us his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the church was born, those patterns that began in that age of grace have continued now for 2,000 years and we're about to see a change as we come to the end of the church age and the end of the age of grace and God prepares for his son's return. It began with the regathering of Israel and the establishment of Israel. The book of Daniel was written to establish this. Uh, Daniel had revelations, uh, visions, dreams from God that established God's plan for Israel specifically because Israel is the focal point of Bible prophecy in the political scene of our world and in the uh, economic scene. They are going to be the integral part of God's plan. Because Jesus, the Messiah, who revelation is all about, we read that in the first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ, when he comes back, he comes back to his people. He comes back to his city, Jerusalem. He comes back to rule and reign from that time forward. 
And so you have to understand that it has been key, it has been key that Israel be reborn and that Israel will continue to succeed, grow, and become stronger and demanding more and more world attention. If there's this much attention on the little state of Israel now, imagine what it will be to provoke the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, to provoke Armageddon. There has to be some massive things to happen to provoke all the nations to gather together. That's why the wars that we've studied and are talking about are so key because they, are, they make sense out of why the world's going to want to go after Israel in the end, in a, in a massive scale. And so then we get to the last part of our divine outline in Revelation 119, and the things which will take place, metatauta, after these things. And that starts in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. It's the next time that word right there is mentioned, metatauta. And so it's after the church age. It's after uh, Jesus' message to the church. And get ready, church. Get ready, church. I'm coming, church. Don't be found off guard. Don't be found complacent. Do not say, my Lord delays his coming and to begin to eat and drink with the drunkards and to abuse your fellow servants. Watch out for the spirit of gossip in the church. Watch out for gluttony and drunkenness. Watch out for the drugs and the alcohol and the pornography and the things that intoxicate the mind and the, the media and the uh, cessation with or I should say, um, hyper-focus. Let's go there. I could use that phrase. The hyper-focus on these things to escape this, the escapism of this planet. Because it says that in the last days, men's hearts will fail because of fear. The world will have such problems too big for humanity to solve until one comes on the scene who looks like he can solve them, but in reality, he's only going to take you into a three and a half year deal. Well, the whole thing is actually a bad rap. The first three and a half years are nothing but, but war and chaos, and the final three and a half, pure terror. More terror than this world has ever seen before. Jesus says there's nothing to compare to those days. Nothing. So what a big deal the book of Revelation is, and no wonder he used signs to give it so that you could have comprehension, so that there could be something to relate to, something to understand or grab a hold of, because how do you describe events that have never, ever taken place on this planet before? And so uh, we, have, we have some interesting reading ahead, but as we do, we're laying a strong foundation. And so let's jump in where we left off. We left off at the very last line of verse one, and it says, he sent and signified it, that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's your focal point. Revelation means unveiling, unveiling. And so it's to make clear that which was not clear. It's to reveal, it's to bring into light, into focus, what? Jesus, the resurrected Lord and the promised ruler of the ages. That's why Daniel fits hand in glove with this book. They are of the same nature and of the same type. And one was said, uh, Daniel, when it was written, God said to Daniel, seal it up. You won't understand it. But when Revelation was written, God said to John, don't seal it for the time is at hand. And so we'll see that. And so signified is an important word here that we want to look at. He signified it. And that is the Greek there, Semeno, Richard Semeno. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Semeno. <laughs> There's where his name came from. Okay. He sig to signify, make known, declare, to indicate clearly, to make clear. I mean, my goodness. That's what this book is about. Do you see that? He came to signify it, not so that you can be befuddled and bewildered 
and try to figure out the hidden meanings. No, no. This book has been delivered with things that we can understand, with pictures we can understand, and then defined for us in the Old Testament, defined for us in itself. There's several signs that will be plainly told, well, well, this is what it is. Others can be found in the Old Testament. And so there's very little that we're left to kind of just absolutely guess in the dark at. And that's why there's such solid outlines of this book that can be understood and followed through. And so here's an example of that word being used in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when the apostle Paul was imprisoned and falsely accused. Okay, so they had no good accusation, no evidence against Paul. But uh, the governor wanted a bribe, so he didn't let Paul free. And he was actually toying with the idea of maybe even using Paul as a pawn to make the Jews happy and be at peace with him. When Paul understood this, he appealed to Caesar as his right as a Roman citizen. But now that put the governor in a very, very bad spot. Because now he's got to explain to Caesar why this prisoner is standing in front of him. And so he says, for it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So he's asking for Herod Agrippa's help. Herod and Bernice, can you come and help me with this case? Because I've got to send to Caesar the reason why I'm bothering him with this matter. And I, his charges need to be clearly defined. That's what that's saying. To specify what he did wrong when I have no idea what he did wrong. Because I can't figure out anything he did wrong. The Jews insisted he did something wrong, but that doesn't help me. And so that's how this word is used. Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify. So the word testify is also used in the same manner is that this is the testimony. When one is giving testimony, remember, this is the testimony of Jesus. This is about him. This is about his work. And so he sent his angel to testify or to signify to you these uh, things in the churches. Remember, his servants were his douloi, his servants. And he wants us to know what he's doing. I no longer call you servants, but friends. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And so then we get to our next uh, uh, phrase. It says, he sent and signified it by his angel. His angel. Angloss. He sent and signified it by his angel. The word angloss is messenger. Um, sent, one sent to announce or proclaim. Now, obviously, it can mean a heavenly messenger. It can mean an earthly messenger. How do you know which one is, is which? By the context. And so there is, there's interpretative uh, measures that have to be taken when you're looking at the context. And clearly, this message came from God in heaven to Jesus in heaven, who gave it to his angel in heaven to bring to John on earth. And so that's the, the, the uh, passing off that you see so that John could present it to the church. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But so Anglos, I want you to understand that this word can be um, human or it can be heavenly. In this case, it is heavenly. But in Matthew 11, verse 10, it's used, the same exact Greek word, anglos, is used for John the Baptist. For this is he, John the Baptist, of whom it is written, Jesus said, behold, I send my anglos before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So I wanted to show you this so that you understand when we get to the uh, seven angels of the churches, that uh, there's a uh, Good reason. In fact, it's best to understand that it's talking about the pastors of those churches rather than heavenly angels that oversee, that miraculously deliver the book. 
because the word is anglos, and it can be messenger, and it's used many times in scriptures. I gave you one example, but there's many times it's used of prophets of God or just people of God that have come representing God as a prophet. And uh, that's John the Baptist. That's why he's called the messenger of God. He's the anglos that, who came before Jesus' face. Uh, Revelation 22, 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Jumping down to verse 8, it says, Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now that's how great an angel is. John can't help himself. You'll find that when he does this, it's usually the message is so good. The news is so good. John is so overwhelmed by the reality of what God's doing. He can't help but worship. But he misfocuses his worship to the messenger rather than to the Lord. And so this is the second time he makes this mistake. John, you make me feel better. I really don't like my frailty. I don't like how easily distracted I am by the things of this world. I can find myself worshiping an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> I mean, how foolish is that? And yet you can relate. It's a good burger. <laughs> then he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brother and the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And so you can see here, in fact, we, we should say this, um, angels, the, the word angel is used uh, over 175 times in the Bible. And over 75 of those times are in the book of Revelation. So what we're finding, what we're going to see here is that Revelation is the greatest revelation of heavenly things as well as earthly for the future. We get to see how heaven and earth affect each other and what's happening in heaven and how it affects the things on earth. We are being allowed behind the veil of the afterlife, or I should say after death, because life just keeps happening. It's death that gets behind you. When we get beyond that point, we're going to see the interaction and have interaction in and relationships with angels as well as the church and those saved and the redeemed of the Lord, Old and New Testament. How incredible will that be? And so this is a very, very great book in seeing how angels work with God and how they are ministering spirits, as Hebrews tells us, uh, who are ministers of, of, the, of salvation. And, and we get to see how God uses angels in his ministry and work. And so here's one of them. And here's what he says is, you know, John, I'm a fellow servant. I serve the Lord. Isn't that exactly what Psalm 103 uh, says about angels? As we get towards the end of that Psalm, he, that his ministering spirits who are a flame of fire doing the Lord's bidding. I'm just his servant, John, just like you. I'm one of the prophets. Why? Because I'm bringing pr a prophetic message sent by my king, Jesus, to you, John, to pass it on to the church. And so John's not the hero here. The angel's not the hero here. God is the hero here. And he's the one who has sent this message. And confirmed this message. And so now we get to finally the last line in the verse one, his servant, John, his servant, John. I'm laughing because I can't believe what time it is. I'm like, wow, we really could just stop here tonight. No, we, we could push on for a few more minutes, at least 20. His servant, John, now, John is the vessel God has chosen as the verification to the church. And God has strategically picked his apostle John. Now, I want you to think about this. The apostles were the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're told in Acts chapter 1. 
that God anointed these men to be witnesses of his resurrection and to testify of the first works of Christ. What he came to do to pay for sin, to accomplish our forgiveness, our salvation, so that we could be with him forever in his kingdom. And John was a main witness. He was one of the main witnesses. And God has kept him alive to the last. And he has prepared this moment to give this message to John so that John could deliver this to the church. And because it is such a profound, mind-blowing message, I mean, the nature of these things have been so beyond human history that just now we're starting to think that this has got to be literal. Through the church age, there was, there was, they took it literal at the first, and I'm going to show you that tonight. But over time, they began to say, well, this really can't mean Israel as a nation, and this really can't mean that the whole world's going to see this happen. How does that happen? And you know, the things that have developed in these last days, the capability to destroy the planet with, with war, the capabilities of even um, pestilence and, you know, we're messing with genetics and creating our own pestilences and diseases and releasing it on populations. Seriously. The things that are going on with, with uh, technology, cloning, artificial intelligence. All of these things are all things that the world, when they read it, didn't get it. A mark on your hand or your forehead that would buy or sell? They can't imagine. Like even nowadays, third world country, you know, if you've never seen a credit card in action, you'll think, well, you, 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 didn't, you didn't give them anything. What are you talking about? I gave him the card. Yeah, but he gave it back to you. <laughs> you didn't give him anything. When you're dealing with binary numbers and, <laughs> you know, computer technology, it's, it's, it's something that's so normal to us now. Tracking. Tracking things. I remember somebody stole my bike out of the garage. Oh, I was so upset. This is years ago. We had a good friend, the sheriff. I called him up. Somebody stole my bike, bro. What? <laughs> he was over uh, theft. So I was calling the right guy. He's all, can I come over? I'm like, yes, get over here. So I can I bring a bike? Of course. I'm going to have it tracked. Pulls up in front of the house. He comes into the house, leaving it unlocked and it's sitting out there. He's all, I'm just going to leave it there for a day or two, see what happens. It only took a few hours. He called me up. We got him. <laughs> they rushed over where this, the tracker took him. It was an apartment complex. They break in. They found a ton of bikes and mine was in pieces and all taken apart. But, yeah. <laughs> God took care of me. It was a bummer, but he always takes care. First world problems, people. Yeah. I got a couple cars too, so. <laughs> so it was so cool though, the tracking. And now we've got it down to where you can stick it in your animal. So you can find your animal and they run away. You know, it's all of these things were so mysterious to the world for years. That's why God says to Daniel, seal up the book. You're not going to get it, buddy. You're not going to get these things. And now, this is just all front page stuff. This is just common everyday life for us. This is just how we roll. This is just how we operate. And so God chose John as a witness because John was so highly respected in the church community. No one questions John, and rightfully so. He has lived a faithful life as a faithful witness. He has cared for Jesus' mother Mary till the day of her death. He has pastored in Israel, in um, Jerusalem, all the way up until right before the destruction 
think they, they predict that he didn't leave until like 60 AD. He did not leave Jerusalem. And then he comes to Ephesus and he pastors in Ephesus. And uh, we're, we'll talk more about that whole scenario there in a minute. But the thing is, is, is he pastors there in Ephesus until persecution arises and he is banished to the island of Patmos. And that's what he'll clarify for us in verse 9. We'll get there in a few months. <laughs> no, I hope not. I hope not. I am sure the rapture will happen at that pace. Gosh, we didn't even get to the rapture in the book. His servant, John. Oh, and John is such a great witness. Now, here's a fun fact. John's name is mentioned five times in the book. And that's unique. Because in John's writing to uh, the church, the gospel of John, he doesn't mention his name even once. But you see, when he was writing about Jesus' life, that was common knowledge. There's such a foundation in who Jesus is and what he had done. And there were three other gospels already written. And what John did was he filled in the holes. Most of John's uh, gospel is new information things that were subtle and behind the scenes that weren't open in public. Yeah, he keeps landmark public moments as a reference, but he focuses mainly on those private conversations with, with Jesus. And so to have his name five times has brought question whether he really wrote this, but it totally makes sense that you would have him sign off on it multiple times because it's so out of this world. It's such a radical, it is so different than the book of John or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's, it's, such a, uh, it's not writing about what has been, like the first chapter. It's writing about what will be, chapters 4 through 22. And it's so massive in its revelation that John needed to keep reiterating. And he says it at key moments and at big moments. I, John, saw this. I, John, witnessed this, and he keeps emphasizing this, and so that's important to see how important God wanted to establish this book for us. He chose John as the last living apostle to ratify this and to write this late in the first century so that we would know these things were future. After the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it's not debated in the first century. It's only debated in the 19th and 20th century, folks. That's a new idea in the sense of um, people throwing this idea out there because if you're going to believe that this was already fulfilled with the destruction of the temple, that means it has to be written before the destruction of the temple. And guess what? It wasn't. It was written 20 plus years after, 25 years after the destruction of the temple. And so um, we'll look at that. And uh, here's our first evidence of that. I want to point this out, that there's, an, there's massive amounts of external evidence of the date that it was written, but there's also internal evidence, and I'll point some of that out as well. The first thing is the church fathers, the first and second century church fathers all say John wrote it. And many of them say he wrote it in the days or time of Domitian. Domitian, and let me just pop this up. There's a coin from Emperor Domitian. He's the first one to take Christian persecution to all of the Roman Empire. You see, um, hmm, I'll get his name. Nero. Yeah. Nero began persecuting the church, but it was only in Rome. It, the city, not in all of the Roman Empire. It wasn't until Domitian when he did an all-out persecution against the church all over the Roman Empire. And so this is the time that these guys say it happened, is during his reign, which you can see the dates. He reigned from 81 to 96, okay? 
Keep that in mind. 81 AD to uh, AD 96. Uh, that was his reign. And the, the span of his reign was 16 years or 15 years, but uh, a little more than 15 years. And you'll see that in a moment. Okay, so now Justin Martyr, who you guys was from Ephesus. Okay, this is the first church that this book is written to, Ephesus. He was born around 100 AD. And you can even tell by his quote that he felt very connected to John himself. He was a martyr. He was martyred for the faith. Um, it was, I think, uh, later, much later in his life. I, I can't remember the date. I think it's 180, something like that. But this, this was written, uh, his writing here, about 135 AD. It says, there was a certain man with us whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ, who prophesied by a revelation that was made to him that those who believe in our Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem. Ah, he takes it literal. A thousand year millennial reign. And that thereafter, the general and in short, the eternal resurrection and judgment of all men would likewise take place. And so he's talking about the book of Revelation and that John wrote it. Here is... Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp who was a disciple of John. And Polycarp was the pastor in Smyrna. So uh, once again, the second church mentioned in the book of Revelation. These guys are as close to the autograph as you can get. And, and he, li um, he lived from 130 to 203. AD 130 to 203. And it says this, this is what he says in his book Against Heresies. He wrote a book called Against Heresies. And it says, but if it had been necessary to announce his name, talking about the Antichrist, I read the larger portion to get context. So, so they're debating on, okay, well then who's the Antichrist? At this time even, they're looking for this fulfillment. And they're saying, who's, what's the name of the Antichrist? And he says, he says, if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse, which is another word for revelation, the Greek there. For it was not seen long ago, but almost in our own time at the end of the reign of Domitian. So he gives it plainly. And that is, uh, the end of his reign was 96, 96 AD. Therefore, John, writing at the end, writes 95, maybe. That's the date given to the book. And I think that's important that you see how well this is established. We don't have this kind of record for most of the books of the Bible. We estimate and guesstimate according to internal and external evidences, but we don't have a lot for most books. This book has a lot of evidence, a lot on when it was written because the church fathers were dealing with the questions about it. And you can imagine they were dealing with questions. <laughs> what? Tertullian, who was around AD 200, says where the apostle John was first plunged, talking about persecution, his persecution, he was plunged unhurt into boiling oil. The deep fry didn't deep fry. And then, and thence readmitted to his island exile. And so he's confirming the report that John says that he had been banished to the island of Patmos for the gospel's sake and the testimony of Jesus. Eusebius, still very early, 260 to 339. This is what he says. They even indicated the time accurately, talking about the time of, of its writing. And it says, relating that in the 15th year of Domitian, Flavia Domit Domitilla, who was the niece of Flavius Clemens, one of the many consuls at Rome at that time, was banished with many others to the island of Pontia as testimony to Christ. 
And so what this is, is confirmation to what John is saying, the timing of a Roman Empire decree of persecution where an emperor banished Christians to islands. And so this is external evidence of a woman who was uh, the daughter of uh, somebody, the niece, <laughs> the niece of Flav Flavius Clemens. See how great my retention is? This is why I have to write this stuff down. One of the many consuls at Rome. And so she was banished for the testimony of Jesus, probably the same time as John. And so you can see here external evidence pointing to this late date. Here's the deal. The church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Victorianus, and Jerome also affirm that Revelation was written during Domitian's reign. In fact, nobody suggested anything different. According to Andy Wood, he's a really great resource, by the way. He's got a great series on Revelation, Andy Wood in Texas. Um, he said that it was 500 a, uh, AD. AD 500 was the first time somebody actually suggested a later date for the writing, or an earlier date for the writing of John, uh, the book of Revelation. Um, I heard uh, somebody else, I think John MacArthur said 300 years after. So, tell, you know, I'm telling you, it's really solid. We have a lot of writers in those early parts, and they all made comments about John and Revelation. And so uh, it's important that uh, we see here how God wanted to, us to know when it was written so that we would not come up with, well, asinine ideas about what it means. That's just, God wants to keep it clear for us that this Bible prophecy, you guys, has always been literal. It's always been literal. And, and, and yes, there are pictures in Ezekiel and in Zechariah just like there is in Revelation. And every time it's the angel will say, you know, what does it mean? Oh, well, you tell me. <laughs> and they get a response. This is what it means. So that you're not left in the dark. And so we're not denying that there's imagery and pictures, but it all is pointing to uh, literal events that are going to take place. And uh, prophecy is just history in, uh, in advance. That's what prophecy is. Um, one aspect of prophecy is that. Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. Let's at least get this far. Who bore witness to the word of God. Talking about John. He's the author. What did he do? He bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. He bore witness of the word of God. Now, what this tells us is that this book is the word of God. That's what that tells us. And that it is the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what that tells us. And that John saw this. It was a vision. And he saw and he wrote these things down as commanded by the Lord. And it is scripture, the word of God, and it is the testimony of Jesus. It's all about him. And so, John was a faithful witness of Jesus' Jesus' first coming, his life, death, and resurrection. And now he is a faithful witness of Jesus' second coming through the vision of Revelation. Look at John 19. I'm just going to shoot through these verses. John 19, 35. And, and he who has seen has testified. And his testimony is true. John talking about himself. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. And you can see here in John, uh, 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Well, what's the word of life? Keep reading. The life was manifested or revealed and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life. That's what he, when he says life, he's talking about eternal life. How does he know it? Resurrection. He is an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus, which 
which was with the Father and was manifested to us. God always had the power to grant eternal life. And he sent his son, the embodiment of eternal life. And he was manifested before us when he was crucified and rose again from the dead the third day. It revealed the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. It revealed Jesus' resurrection power. And this is what John's testifying to. He says, I'm just a witness. I'm a testi My testimony is of Jesus and of his resurrection power eternal life. He goes on to say in 1 John 4, 14, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. That was his first testimony. 1 John 5, 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. That's the Holy Spirit. He who does not believe God has made him, that is God, a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. To reject Jesus is to reject God. To reject God is to never know his Holy Spirit's work inside of you. Yes, he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come on the outside. You want to know him on the inside? You want to know that internal witness? Receive him. Believe in him, and you will know that witness. Revelation 19.10, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. There it is. Prophecy is about Jesus. Not that Jesus needs prophecy, but prophecy needs Jesus. You know, you've heard uh, this saying, history is his story. Well, prophecy is his story in advance. And that's why it's all about Jesus, because this world's going nowhere and getting nothing unless Jesus shows up to do it. And that's why prophecy is built around Jesus, and we don't want to lose focus and make it all about Antichrist or last world government or plague this, uh, punishment that, open this, do that. All those things are all the working of Christ bringing forth the implement, implementation of his glory. He's just building the scene. And you know what I see? As an artist, when he wants to do his most brilliant work, works off of the black canvas. And that's what you read when Jesus comes again, the stars no longer give their light. The universe has been shut down and shut out. And the world is sitting by itself in a dark, dark backdrop. And here comes the king in the brilliance of his own light. He dwells in unapproachable light, coming in his glory with light bursting through his fingertips. And oh man, I can't wait. <laughs> We're gonna see it. And uh, last verse, last verse, you can't, well, no, one more, one more. Last chapter, can't go much further than this. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. You see that confirmation? Uh, what John is saying to us in verse 2 that he is testifying of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's one and the same. It's synonymous. The word of God is the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the volume of, book, of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. It's all about him. In the scriptures, you think you have life, but they are which testify of me, Jesus says in John to the uh, scribes and Pharisees. They testify of me and you will not come to me so that you can have life. He's offering life, and he is life itself. And finally, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And so Jesus is testifying of his second coming, and he's affirming it and signifying it by this revelation that he has given John through his angel. 
And we have been handed this as servants of Jesus Christ to know his work and to know his will and to know what's coming down. And that's exciting stuff, brothers and sisters. That is exciting stuff. And I can't show you the conclusion because the conclusion was after chapter three, uh, verse 3. So we'll just have to wait for next week. We'll jump into next, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 next week. So praise you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your magnificent word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given so much detail uh, to us and for us about your second coming. And I know it's plain that you just don't want us to miss it. You don't want us to miss it. You don't want us to walk in the dark. You don't want us to be of the night, but of the day and of the light. And I pray, Father, that you would just set our hearts aglow, that we might be ready to receive you as our Lord and King at your return for us. That whether we die and go to your presence or you come for us and call us into the clouds in that first Thessalonians chapter 4 rapture of the church, then, Lord, either way, Father, may we be found in you and ready to go when you call. So, Lord, equip us, bless us, and continue your work in us, Lord, as we see crazy times happening in our world today. Only you know the future, and only you know what's about to come down. So, Lord, we're going to rest in you. We're going to hold on to you. We're going to trust you, and we're going to look for your deliverance in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.